So, um, thank you. Thank you. Have the microphone on, shall we make a start? Welcome to Harlow Council's Cabinet meeting. Um, are there any apologies from absence? No? Thank you. Um, before we move on, I'd just like to inform people um, we're going, not going to be discussing item 16 today, the future bus station provision. Um, we'd like... Or shelter, not bus. What did I say? Station? I can't read my own writing. I do, do apologise. Bus shelter provision, uh, as we want to take a further look at the proposal in the light of um, information from Garden Town. Any declarations of interest? Minutes. Um, are we happy to approve the minutes held of the cabinet meeting held on the 20th of June 2019? Agreed. Thank you. There are no written questions from the. Any matters arising? I do apologise. Um, I would like to draw your attention, actually, if there's nothing else. We look at the matters arising from the minutes um, to the public space protection order for the town centre. Um, this should actually be coming into force from the 5th of August, following advice um, on signage and other things required. Um, Jane, would you like to spend on that just for a moment? Yes, so the order's now been sealed, and uh, people have the right to appear against the order for a period of six weeks from the date of the cabinet, so that takes us up to the 25th of July. So at the moment we're producing the signage and the leaflets and there'll be a um, information sharing and uh, education uh, process going on with members of the public uh, and the order will start from the 5th of August uh, after the six weeks has expired. Excellent. Thank you. There are no written questions from the public. There is a written question from uh, Councillor Vince. Yeah. Would you like to read it? Yeah, obviously. Uh, at full council on the 11th of July, Councillor Carl <coughs> said that the council had given £3 million of right to buy receipts back to the government. Can the leader please state whether this is true? And if so, set out the reasons why the money has been given back to the government. Okay. Um, when Councillor Carlson said Harlow had given back three and a half million pounds to the government from unspent right to buy receipts in the financial year 2018-19, he was guilty of oversimplifying the situation to a degree that could have been very misleading to Harlow residents. The simple unvarnished truth <laughs> is that three and a half million pounds of Harlow's right to buy council house sales receipts was taken from Harlow because Tory policy at a national level made it impossible to do anything else. Under current arrangements, the receipts generated through right to buy housing disposable, disposals are repayable to the government. The regulations allow authorities to retain those receipts, but only if they intend to utilise them for the replacement of housing stock, either through new build, conversion or open market purchase. Unfortunately, the regulations also state that receipts that are retained by a local authority can only contribute up to 30% of the cost of replacing the homes lost under right to buy. The local authority therefore has to fund the additional 70% of any scheme it implements. The regulations also state that if right to buy receipts are retained, they must be applied to schemes and must be used within a three year period. If this is not achieved, then the full value of the receipts must be repaid to the government in full and with the addition of, an, of a 4% interest charge. Based upon the council's housing pipeline costing in the region of 14 million in the next three years, the council has already retained 4 million of 2017-18 right to buy receipts to contribute towards 30% of the cost of these schemes. However, during 2018-19, the council was unable to retain any further receipts because of the three-year time restriction placed upon the use of those receipts by government regulations. The council lost 3.5 million of its receipts in 2018-19 as a result of the government's regulations, money which could have been retained in Harlow for Harlow if the time restriction and interest penalties had not been in place. The Council expects to continue to retain right to buy receipts during the 2019-20 period to help to fund later stages of its housing delivery pipeline. Thank you. 
Yeah. Uh, could Harlow not borrow to speed up delivery of New Homes and must retain the 3.5 million that Councillor Carl mentioned after all the cap on borrowing for houses was lifted by this government? Well, look, Chris, that is something that we looked into. Um, unfortunately, the removal of the borrowing cap really wasn't of much help to Harlow. It came after legislation in 2020, 2012 that was imposed, again by the Tories, that required Harlow, like all other councils in the country, to buy its own stock of council houses in, the right, in return for the right to keep council house rents. Harlow had to borrow a quarter of a billion pounds. 250 million pounds to buy its own housing stock from the government. And in return for that, we got the right to keep the rents. Well, actually, the rents paid the interest on that loan, that quarter of a billion. And it even paid a small amount of the capital. Unfortunately, further legislation demanded that councils cut council rents by 1% a year for a period of four years. So our ability to repay the interest and some of the capital was destroyed. In effect, what we've been able to do since the rent reductions is pay only the interest. So although it was legally possible to borrow more, in terms of being able to repay it and be financially responsible, it was impossible, again, thanks to Tory legislation. Of course, had the core government support given to Harlow, since 2010, not being cut by £7 million pounds as a community in total, we'd have had enough money in the bank to keep it. But they cut their as well. So was Carl, Councillor Carter right to say we've given back £3.5 million pounds of right to buy receipts to the government? No, you won't. We were forced, over a barrel, by a raft of Tory legislation to hand over money that was no legal or financial, financially responsible way of retaining. Yet again, Tory councillors identify a problem caused by a Tory government, and instead of pushing back on Harlow's Tory MP, who so faithfully voted for the legislation that enabled this situation, they attempt to put the blame on Harlow Council's doors, and they sit there laughing about the three and a half million yeah. that the Tories yeah. took from us. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> And we will move on. Yes, I have prepared answers. Yeah. I think it's part of my job. <laughs> yeah, okay. Petitions. There are none. Full plan. Is it noted? No, no, noted. Oh, we need to be a quick picture of that future council council, but go on. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, on page 12, there's an item about the Article 4 directive coming forward in. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm just people actually listening to what I say. Oh. Um, on okay, page 12, on the, uh, the, on the third item, town, town wide open for directive, uh, coming to you September. Does that mean we'll get a decision from the Secretary of State by that date? So it's on the forward plan in case we have any objections, because if we have any objections it has to come back to Cabinet. Oh. Uh, if we don't have any objections we can just implement it. Right. So we can actually do something here. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, another technical question. Um, page 21, the first item I own the strategy. To confess, I have been tracking this. Um, I've been informed elsewhere that this should be coming to us in October. You have a date for it? It is still indeed coming to October's uh, cabinet meeting. So, why isn't it in the work there? I don't know, Kate for Carter. It had, it, it's very clear that it's coming to October's uh, meeting. I explained at the last meeting, sorry, I explained at the last meeting that it was originally coming in September, but we had to go out for a legal consultation and it will now uh, come to October's cabinet meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Right, on that basis, are we happy to note the um, work plan? Noted again. Okay. Okay.
Thank you. <coughs> no decisions taken by myself or the deputy or portfolio. Mm -hmm. So let's move on, please, to item 10, the Town Centre Area Action Plan, approval of Regulation 19 consultation, pages 23 to 175. Uh, Councillor Perth. Yes, thank you, Chair. I apologise for the fact that we probably cut down 100 trees to uh, reduce the full uh, uh, air draft air action plan, but obviously uh, it's there for members to consider. Now this report refers to the next major step in the process <coughs> of redeveloping the town centre, part of the uh, requirement really for the future of the town, our aspirations for the development of the garden town requires that we also redevelop the, uh, a town centre that's appropriate for a much larger community. And obviously, in order to also to bring it up to date to make it more modern, more relative to the situation which we all will observe, uh, the changing face of retail, the need for more leisure and entertainment um, facilities, and also the whole question of the public realm that needs bringing up today. All those things are referred to uh, in the Town Centre Air Action Plan. But specifically this report tonight <coughs> is concerning our uh, the next step, which is to go to Regulation 19 uh, consultation. If you look at page 35, it uh, provides a handy step-by-step -step guide as to the five steps we've been through so far, the last one being the preparation of this very draft plan. And over the page on 36, uh, it says we are here, we need to go to Regulation 19. Now, Regulation 19 <coughs> uh, consultation uh, on this particular draft, uh, as it states on page 35, should be considered against four tests. Is it positively prepared? Is it justified? Is it effective? And is it consistent with national policy? And obviously, uh, we consider that it is, but that is for the uh, consultation process to, um, if people want to suggest that uh, either they, they agree with us or whether they feel that on one of those four tests, the draft plan uh, is non-compliant. Uh, after the <coughs> consultation process, um, then so obviously assume, assuming on the assumption that uh, it passes the full test, uh, as far as this cabinet is concerned, then we go to, we submit it to the final draft, which will then be the final draft, to an inspector and have the uh, examination in public. And then we'll get the inspector's report and by winter of this year into January next year, we should be in a position to be able to adopt uh, and, and have adopted the final town centre area of action plan, which will then be part of the overall local development plan for the whole town, and obviously as far as we're concerned, an integral part of the plans for the garden town, which obviously go beyond our own boundaries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anything to second that? Uh, I'm happy to second it and like to say a few words later on. Okay. <coughs> Any questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. Um, a few open questions about the, the action plan itself. Um, the first question I have, and it's something that um, I've brought up consistently, and I think it's a really important fact that all councillors agree with. As part of the Town Centre Action Plan and this ongoing consultation, what priority is the Council and the Administration giving to designing the Town Centre for age and mobility? Given that we have an ageing population in the town, the uh, number of 90 olds in Harlow is the highest outside London. These are factors that need to be taken into consideration when we look at 
how people flow through the town centre. And I just be wondered, I was just wondering if the administration would, would give us some some initial thoughts on that and how they could build that into potentially the consultation. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, as I say, Chair, the four tests include every aspect of the design uh, of the future town centre, and obviously access accessibility will be one of, uh, included in one of those four tests. Thank you. Uh, no specifics, is it? But, um, so the next question I have yeah. is um, clearly on pages 60 and 59 of the agenda. Um, which re relate to the action plan. You've looked at threats and strengths and weaknesses. Now, is there an updated risk register that sits behind the Town Centre action plan? And, and if that action plan has been updated since all the subsequent talks and the work on the action plan, what consideration has been given by the Council um, in particular around developer buying, because that's really important and crucial with, with getting the, the town centre up and running. So just be wondering, wondering if the portfolio holder or perhaps the senior officers could talk about that. The, um, the risk assessment will feature as part of the sustainability appraisal, appraisal which we're just commissioning uh, to be undertaken by ACOM and that's going to take place over the next couple of months and as we said in, in the report um, that needs to be completed before the document is published for consultation but that sort of risk assessment will, will feature as part of that sustainability appraisal which is looking at social and economic environmental impacts <coughs> of the policies in this document and, and, and any risks associated with that. So that will feature as part of the overall package of consultation materials um, when that goes out to full consultation. And that's really helpful. And I think in particular, developer buy-in is, is really crucial. And I, I, I was interested if the council itself had looked uh, at giving allocating specific risks around this as it's been developing it. And I'd just be wondering, Andrew, if you specifically have given any consideration around that, because, it, and this is public knowledge and, and it has been discussed before, take for example the Strawberry Star Group that's taken over from Addington Capital, as we all know, and it's in the, in the public domain, they took out a £10 million loan on a 12-month loan agreement. Um, are they going to be here for the long haul? What we want to see is developers buying into this vision and supporting its efforts and that to me I think is a risk. It's not a risk that the council can completely control, don't get me wrong, but it is a factor that we need to, to, to take into consideration. So is there questions? Well, yeah, uh, yeah, there is. Just a speech. No, 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 no. If, if there was a question, oh, I, I missed no. it, but does some have you an answer to this question? Yeah, yeah, yeah it I, does. I, well, I, I think uh, absolutely, we, we uh, acknowledge those points and yeah. clearly we can't control um, all the actions of individual private developers but I think what we would see is that the production of the air action plan um, for the first time perhaps <coughs> for Harlow Council provides a, a set of really strong robust policies that developers have to abide by mm. uh, and, and, and we will give us much stronger tools than we currently have in our armory of, of planning policies to be able to influence what gets built in the town centre uh, and I, the way that the air action plan has been drafted is in, in the spirit of positive planning um, so it's about setting out aspirations and, and what we want to see to attract quality developers who buy into those aspirations and, yeah, I think um, so hopefully the document will, will achieve that I think, Councillor Charles, if I can just add to that, um, I share your concerns about short-termism, and um, it's certainly been a topic of um, debate in many different forums that I've been in about um, the need for a, a long-term vision. Then uh, the next <coughs> question I have, and it's, it's alluded to on page 60 under the threats, and it's in particular around investment, and the Council's considerations around sustainable investment pathway for the ambitions it set out in the Town Centre Action Plan. I, I remind people there is cross-party consensus in the Town Centre Action Plan um, and we are behind having a revitalised Town Centre. So my question is, does the Council 
factor into its planning, whether it's a 10 year or a 20 year cycle, the kinds of sustainable investment pathway it needs to achieve to realise the ambitions in the action plan. I'm not sure, Chair, that is relevant to the town centre area action plan. That's more of a commercial discussion. And of course, as uh, everybody knows, we have very little commercial ownership in the town centre. Mm -hmm. We are we are discussing the possibility with commercial operators in the town centre whether we could set up a business improvement district. Uh, because obviously, as we proceed with this plan, there's no doubt that the private owners of almost all the town centre are going to benefit in terms of the the value of their property from the improvements that we are seeking to make. And I think it's only right that they should uh, not only participate positively in taking our whole aspiration forward, but actually contribute financially towards its achievement. So just again, the, the portfolio holder has got a grasp of his brief because on page 60, under threats, it says investment delivered in isolation. That's a planning consideration and it's within this action plan. So my question is entirely valid and it's a strategic one around everyone wants to get behind the town centre and revitalising it. My question is the forward planning around the kinds of investments you're going to need kind of investments in certain areas where it's commercial space, etc. But in, on page 60 you refer to it in the plan. Perhaps you haven't even read your own action plan. And that means surprise me about you. Well, no, I'm not entirely sure what the question is again. Councillor, have you read your plan? Well, also that's the question. I've been involved in it enough. Right, any other questions? Right, any comments? Let's search. Change things up a bit. Councillor Carter. Thank you, Chair. Page 85, um, it's an issue that uh, came up at the uh, uh, presentation that uh, we had recently um, about um, cycling. Uh, uh, about cycling. Cycling. Yeah, cycling. Good. Um, it's good to see that you know, the, the issue is being addressed you know, particularly in the light of the uh, uh, PSPO um, and, you know, and there are going to be dedicated cycle routes uh, and parking provision as indicated on the map um, <coughs> but they, they will be, they will be neat. Uh, I mean, okay, we, we, we're, we're looking you know, to the forward, it's, it's a long way forward uh, <coughs> but as uh, um, uh, Jane Greer has just been saying about the PSPO about the signage there needs to be sort of clear signage um, and you know, thought got into uh, the, the cycle routes. So cyclists know where they're welcome and where they're not. So, I mean, good. That's the chance. So Chair, there's been a long-standing cross-party consensus on town um, sense of regeneration. I think this action plan is important. But what I would say, um, first of all, I want to start off with the thanks because Council Durkin uh, over many years has followed the spirit of cross-party working uh, on, on the town centre uh, and I, and I uh, on a cross-party basis I want to congratulate his constructive style in moving this forward because actually it benefits the whole town that um, councillors irrespective of their party can work together on this because it's, it's a, obviously the town centre is an important linchpin into the local economy. Sadly, Councillor Purton is never on top of his brief. We've seen this time and time again, and we actually need some strategic thinking to carry the action plan forward. Councillor Purton is not showing that tonight and has been reluctant in answer, answering questions that are legitimate around the investment pathway that we need to secure in the next 15 to 20 years for the town centre. The issues around ensuring that we preserve age and mobility, uh, we, we preserve the opportunity to deliver a town centre in the future that factor in, factors in our ageing population and the need to make sure that the town centre takes into consideration people with disabilities as well. These are important considerations and I would have appreciated a more constructive approach by Councillor Burton, but his record speaks for itself <coughs> that he's just simply not able to do that. 
Thank you. Well, I'm happy to disagree with you on that, um, Councillor Charles. I thought um, Councillor Purton and the officers were very clear about how they're going to um, build in uh, your concerns about our ageing population to the design for the town centre. I heard that very clearly. If anything, um, it was your question that the two GM that got a little bit vague. Um, nonetheless, let's move on. Does anybody else want to speak? Can I just say that we, we, we have a, a purpose built vehicle for inter party discussions about all planning matters, which meets on a regular basis, and it's called the Local Development Plan Panel. Uh, representatives from the opposition and representatives from the administration <coughs> sit on it and converse quite amicably about all these issues in great detail. So it's not true to say. What, what I think is regrettable is that we turn up at a cabinet meeting to discuss a high level decision about a process that's already gone through a number of stages and, and what we get is basically showboating about nitpicking about things that you know will be part of the whole process which is why I'm not particularly interested in participating in it. Councillor Dirk. Thank you very much and, um, and thank you for the uh, uh, mention. Uh, I think we should all welcome this report and I think we should all endorse it because whilst historically we've done a lot of talking and we've done small wins, this is the real first chance that we've actually got to adopt a plan that will give us the tools and the opportunities to make the difference for this town moving forward. It's a long time overdue, and I think the difficulty is it's like everything, and I, I've used the word frustrating on, on quite a lot of occasions these days. It is frustrating that it takes us this time to get to this point, but we are at this point, and I think it's a unique point, and I think all the officers, past and present, uh, should be congratulated for the work they've done, including the introduction when we had with Harlow Renaissance, yeah. because a lot of the work within this document has built on those particular areas. It is absolutely true that we've got to have access into the town, because historically, if you look at the town, it's a roundabout surrounded by a road looking inwards. It was a design for the time, but it's no longer a design for the future. So this provides us with that opportunity. And as the person with the economic portfolio, of course we want access, because access brings people, and people bring money. And therefore, shops and businesses want to thrive in our particular town. So one follows the other. If you don't build the roads, all the pathways, all the public ways, people will not come in, and they will not do. Because at the end of the day, it is about trying to make the money. It's about businesses, hang on, that's how I'm it's about businesses, it's about leisure and pleasure, and it's about the whole town, not just a certain culture or a certain group in town. And I know it's frustrating because some people now view us as, as a coffee culture, but, and, and people don't want to come into town for that. We need to change that, and this, this gives us the tools, the opportunity, the influence on businesses currently and future to go out with that real investment. And the other point that you're making, absolutely, it's true. We have to invest. Um, but we have to invest right, uh, the, for the right reasons, with the right partners. And the person, the group that you discussed, yes, there are concerns, there are legitimate concerns. But these are businesses that have the right to buy and have the right to put those planning applications in. And not unless there is something legal, there is very little we can actually do. So we need to work with these people to make sure our town centre is the best for everybody, not just the few. So I, I welcome and endorse um, uh, this report. Awesome. Thank you. Um, that's very good. Just in the short term, can we also do something about the existing access? When one looks at the underpass at Sharpcroft, not us to do something, uh, the county council, can the county council kindly do something about the existing access to the town centre at the moment? That access, mm. to, which is supposedly designed for people in wheelchairs that's happy to go through, is so potholed, mm. and, and it's been like this for years. Those are the sort of things that need addressing now, whilst, whilst we wait the future development, and I hope that our Conservative colleagues will take it up with their Conservative colleagues in terms of getting something done in the short term about the appalling state of the, of the access roads about 
around the town. Yeah. Yeah. I do appreciate what you're saying, uh, Councillor Edwards, but this item is whether or not we yeah. approve yeah. this document to go out to um, uh, Section 19 consultation. Um, any other comments on the document, on item, agenda item 10? So, do we agree to accept the recommendations? Um, A, that we approve the draft town centre action plan is published for the purposes of consultation under regula regulation 19 of the Town and Country Planning um, Act and delegate authority to the managing director in consultation with the portfolio holders for environment and regeneration to make and approve any minor or inconsequential amendments to this plan arising from the completion of ensuing technical documents and any further legal advice. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. So let's now move on to item 11, page 176 to page 204, which is the um, JFPR, the Joint Finance and Performance Record. Uh, report, and I am moving that. Do I have somebody to second it? Chair. Thank you. Can't talk and find the page at the same time. Give me a second. 176. Yeah, I'm afraid. It's age. Right. So I'd like to start by drawing your attention to page 191. If you could turn there. Which is the summary from our section um, from, from uh, 151 from uh, Mr. Freeman, a head of finance, is summary about the latest financial position. And I'm going to draw a few <coughs> sentences out of there. From the first paragraph, the council continues to face financial challenges, especially those created by the long-term deductions in its core government funding which have and will continue to feature within its medium-term financial strategy. Councils across the country, council leaders that I meet with, are crying out that um, in the forthcoming spending review, <coughs> this Tory government starts to address these um, drastic cuts. As has been previously reported to Cabinet, the long period of austerity and the resulting budget reductions that have been required over an extended period to enable a balanced budget to approve each year are now creating a much greater challenge at service level in terms of managing service costs and income to the approved budgets. Um, and then if we look at the fourth paragraph, the final paragraph there, um, this report shows that there's a, a service underspend, if we look at the specifics, of £124,000 um, on control above, controllable budgets. That's 0.21% of the council gross budget. I think it shows, councillors, that we're running a very, very tight ship financially on the bits that we can control. Taking into account the non-controllable costs, there is a forecast underspend of 1.8 million, or 3% of the gross budget, mainly resulting from unplanned government support for the business rates retention scheme, a reduction in the cost of housing benefit, and the additional income generated through the winding up of Kia Harlow, JB Co, and HTS fees as previously reported. Um, whilst this is a one-off sum, it's very, very welcome, um, and we'll use this one-off 1.8 million as follows, as, and it's outlined elsewhere in the report. We'll use 1.3 million for environmental improvements, following on from the success of our um, spending last year. Um, some of which, much of which perhaps, will go towards easing parking in some of the worst affected um, estates. Harlow was not built for the number of cars that residents now have. We need to address that situation um, now. Um, we're going to commit £400,000 for regeneration across the town. And we're going to commit £100,000 to secure the future of the museum, which, since we took it over in January, has been a major success. We've received nothing but applause from people that have visited it. And I'd like to take you to page 180, please, which talks about operational performance. And of course, without a sound financial basis, our operational performance um, couldn't happen. But let's look. Paragraph 20 says, Section 4 of the appendix details the Council's operational performance. The Council performed on or above target 
for 53 out of 53. That's 100% of its quarterly and annual performance indicators. And that's for the third successive quarter. Never before has the council achieved 100%, and now we've done it three quarters on the trot. It's a remarkable success, and I think we should take a moment to thank the officers of this organisation, the staff of this organisation, and our workers in HTS who have been able to deliver that incredible success. Actually. 21 says 62% of the indicators have been maintained or improved compared to quarter four of 2017-18. Um, 94% of the corporate milestones were successfully completed and the remaining 6% of the milestones were delivered due to changing priorities, sorry, were deferred due to changing priorities or the due dates will take place in the new financial year. The council continues to improve its performance in key areas. The percentage of customer complaints responded to within the target town, there's an improvement, the target, target time, an improvement. The number of households living in temporary accommodations, we've improved there. Abandoned vehicles being investigated and removed within 24 hours, an improvement. The average time in hours to remove fly tips, and residents have commented on this. They've phoned me up and they said, people have dumped some rubbish. I phoned in within 24 hours, the fly tipping has gone. And that's a really important achievement because where one person dumps rubbish, if it's left, others feel entitled yeah. to dump some more. <coughs> Clear it up and it stops more rubbish being dumped. Yeah. And customer satisfaction with grounds maintenance services has improved. Finally, I'd like you all to turn to page 198. There's some more headlines there, some more good news for the residents of Harlow delivered by this council. 100% of offensive and non-offensive graffiti was removed within 24 hours. 100% of damaged bins were repaired or replaced within two working days. There's 100% compliance with landscape maintenance requirements. 100% compliance with prevention of dangerous trees reported, inspected and made temporarily safe within 24 hours to be dealt with properly um, in due course. 100% compliance with managing emergencies, and that's an attendance within two hours. 98% customer satisfaction with non-housing repairs. When you see all the other 100%, you wonder why it's not 100. Our call centre has consistently exceeded its target, performing at an average of 97% customer service level against a target of 90%. Health and safety. We completed 1.4 million working hours without an incident. Our AIR rating of naught was achieved and maintained throughout the year. Our Rosper Gold H and Health and Safety Award was achieved. Our Rosper Gold Fleet Safety Award was achieved. And we achieved the British Safety Council Award with merit. Councillors, yet again, this is a good news story for Harmer. We have delivered within budgets, improved performance, and I'm sure the residents of Harlow will be pleased about that. Thank you. Uh, do I have a second for that? A second, yes, yeah. Thank you. Any questions? Councillor Charles. Uh, thanks, Chair. Page 193, looking at the major uh, variances. <coughs> Under the Playhouse, the 200k overspend, <coughs> which in the explanatory notes it says is related to the Playhouse Capital Investment Programme. It's, it's a technical accounting question, but I would have thought that this wouldn't be in the general fund, it would be in the capital budget, the council capital budget. Is there, is there a reason why this is featuring in the general fund? Yeah, so um, previously uh, we've been able to charge um, certain elements of staff time to certain elements of capital schemes. Uh, unfortunately, that changed during 2018-19, and full cost was borne by the general fund. Uh, so, therefore, there's a benefit to the capital program, but a disadvantage to the general fund. Councillor Carter. Thank you. Um, there will be comments, obviously, uh, uh, coming afterwards. Uh, page 179, paragraph 14. Uh, the last sentence reads, subject to capital decision, 
Forecast level for 1920 on the general fund will be 1.8 million above the minimum recommended balance. Now, the recommended minimum balance uh, on, in the MTFS is 2.5 million. So I'm wondering what specific risks and likelihoods have been identified since then requiring the, the additional 1.8 million reserve on the general fund. So I think in response to Councillor Carter's question, I think those uh, reasons were set out in the reports that was brought forward to the um, Cabinet meeting back in January and were very much focused around the uncertainties that we face over and above our normal ongoing issues around the changes in our funding arrangements, potentially from 2021, although we currently don't have details of what those changes will be. So I recommended back in January that it would be prudent to operate above the minimum level to enable us to uh, be confident of moving into that new funding arrangement with sufficient reserves should they be required to ride through any transition period. Thank you. Councillor Downs. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I, I attended the, uh, the local government conference uh, only a couple of weeks ago. <coughs> Councillors all over the country are tearing their hair out about the uncertainty of finance next year. We were due to actually be dependent on the business rate. The government, the chaotic government, has given up governing this country. Um, Brock and Shear came and addressed us and, with warm words and told us, as the minister, I know nothing as well because I might not be in this job in two weeks' time. We are governed by chaos at the moment, and given those circumstances, Chair, it's very prudent to actually keep some money back until the government finally gets its act together and actually tells us, one way or the other, how it's going to actually shape up local government finances for the future. Thank you. I'm uh, grateful for the uh, response. If there is an identifiable risk uh, and likelihood, then why isn't the minimum balance just increased to £4 million? I don't understand why we have to have this whole fluffy bit uh, sort of carried on from month to month. Anyway, there we are. Um, so, was that a question? No. Um, um, I think we're still on questions, Councillor. Yes, I realise that. Uh, yeah. Paragraph 17, um, you've um, already referred to the million pound environment fund and how it was spent last year. Um, well, I'm not aware of any details of that, but I was, I was interested in your comment that some of this money had been, had been spent on improving parking when in that million pounds spent last year or... or Councillor, what I said was the new money, 1.3 million, would yeah. include environmental spending, including parking. And I said um, the environmental part building on the success of the money that we spent on environmental improvements last year. I didn't say last year's million had been spent on parking. I wasn't clear. I'm just. grateful for the clarification, um, but <coughs> probably not tonight. Uh, if, if somebody can provide me as to where that million pounds has gone, uh, I'd certainly be very interested, and I'm sure the residents will be interested to see exactly where that money has gone. Um, is that a question? That's a question, yes, I'd like to know. The answer money. is yes, I'm happy to provide that for you. Thank you. Good. When? Oh, I think so I could do it in the next couple of days. Okay. Well, there we go. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Um, on page 199, we were um, talking about the OEA um, <coughs> and, uh, and the new contract. One of the aspects of the new contract was that we we're not going to collect green waste in bags anymore. So this is the page. 199, thank you. Thank you. One of the aspects of the uh, new contract we were, was that we weren't going to uh, collect waste in bags anymore. Uh, but I understand we are still doing that, um, which requires the bags to be ripped open and the waste dumped in the, um, in the back of the truck. Unfortunately, there was, because it wasn't included in the contract, the vehicles don't have uh, anywhere to store the empty bags. I'm just wondering when the bag ban will come in. I'm happy to have a van following a van following a van. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I think that's quite technical. Yes. Back to seven days? Seven days. Uh, I certainly can do it in seven days. Thank you. <laughs> Page 104. Page 104. We're looking <laughs> at the proposed end of year general fund earmark reserves movements. Um, 
I'm wondering if it's possible that the balances of each of those reserves could be added to that table and perhaps circulated with the minutes, just to put the actual movements in perspective. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of movements going on there. For example, uh, £42,000 has been spent from the street light reserve. Does this mean we're still paying Essex Council to have the lights on between midnight and five o'clock? Um, it was a, a long-term agreement that we entered into and the uh, reserve, as we previously uh, have discussed in, in, this, in the Cabinet meetings, was to help meet the inflation cost on that contractual arrangement going forward. Um, in terms of the um, closing balances, I can certainly make those available and they are already available on the website on the draft statement of accounts which we published. Okay, thank you much. Um, also, on the fifth item on that table, uh, referring to environmental urgent works, and I quote, to finance works in the Harlow wider town area. Does this mean there is spending outside of the Harlow town area? So, so no, um, they are uh, all being spent within Harlow, and it refers to the item that the uh, leader of the council mentioned in the uh, introduction to the report on the £1 million pounds of investments. So the use of the wider town down is unnecessary. Okay, is that a question? Mm -hmm. Not really. Yeah. No, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> right, thank you. Any questions? Other questions? Anybody like to comment on the JFPR? Um, in your um, uh, introduction, you were uh, very gracious in the uh, comedy on the performance of, uh, of HTS, uh, both in terms of the KPIs and the health and safety, and I'm sure Councillor Vince will, uh, uh, will join me in that. Um, I, I, I was interested in, you, in your use of the word we uh, in, in reference to HTS when HS is an entirely separate legal entity with its own management and board of directors uh, and it is they who actually deliver uh, the performance of the company, subject to the service of agreement of course. Um, but I think it's fair to, fair to distinguish, you know, there are two separate organisations here. Um, both of them are doing well, you've uh, you know, counted on KPIs, very good, and uh, stay staff is to be uh, congratulated on that. Thank you. And just come back to you that by we, I mean people that are serving the um, residents of Harmer. Thank you. And that by we, those that are delivering the services to the residents of Harmer so successfully this year. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Charles. Uh, well, thank you, Chair. Obviously, there, a lot of attention has been focused on the comprehensive spending review and how that will factory and local government spending, other particular issues around social care. Uh, as far as what the government has said this week, the work is being undertaken to review spending, although there hasn't been an official announcement on the status of the comprehensive spending review. It isn't actually technically delayed because that was due to come in the autumn. But clearly all councillors want to see the kick-off of the comprehensive spending review because it will factor in local government uh, funding. What is interesting about this performance report, and it's something that the leader of our group has said repeatedly uh, at Cabinet, is with any major organisation, particularly within local government, it is very important, perhaps it's a role for the Audit um, and Standards Committee, Audit and Risk Committee, to look at how we can, in terms of ensuring momentum within uh, the Council, have wider stretch targets on some of the key uh, performance indicators. And I think that's always best practice, it's something that Andrew, our group leader, has always talked about. And I'd be interested to see as the new key performance indicators have developed, not only from an administration perspective, but also from, from Brian as the uh, managing director of the council, how you see that forming and shaping up and what the timeline is to, to look at how we can, can look at, say, let's, let's push the boundaries here and try and improve the import performance with stretch targets. If I may, yes, I mean, we review the targets annually, as you would expect. 
Um, because clearly, I was expecting that question, when you do the 100% three times on the shot, somebody's going to say, well, are these targets really the ones we should be looking at? Um, I think my first comment on that is, since I've been here, we've never once hit them 100% until three ago. And those targets have not been made weaker in order to do that, but now quite clearly we need to look at them to make sure, well, can we stretch them even more? And it may be that when we come back, we'll have missed a few. But that's no bad thing, because we're looking at stretching them. So we are reviewing them, and uh, yeah. we do continue. Any other comments? Right then, um, are we happy to accept the recommendation A, B, and C as laid out on page 176? Yes, agreed. Great. Thank you. So now let's move on to agenda item 12, the Housing Revenue Account <coughs> Outturn Report 2018-19, which you will find on pages 205 to 215. So moved, Chair. Yeah. And I second that, Chair. Again. Do you want to make any comments? Um, well, I'll come briefly, Chair. Um, as, as ever, really, in, in recent years, good financial control, the officers really doing quite a good job on this. Um, the variation of, of the budget, um, small overspend of uh, 121,000, which given the size of the budget is, is um, less than uh, less than 1% of uh, the, the, the actual budget. Taking into account adjustments to the housing capital program and the impacts, um, the underspend really, um, in that regard is, is um, further looked at um, on pages 213 to 215. So unless people want me to go into that detail, um, that the, the explanation is given there, Chair. So, questions? Any comments? No, that's a comment. Thank you. Comment. Yes, sir. Uh, please know if there were no questions. I um, just want to um, explain the, uh, the cross-party working, I think, there is uh, on, on, on housing, which has been going on for a number of years. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, any sort of questions and so forth I do have, I, I, I am receiving answers to them, uh, and also actually contributing to uh, the debate on, 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 uh, on some occasions as well. So uh, we do work. So we do work together sometimes. Mm. Indeed, I understand you asked somewhere between ten and twenty questions at the last. I'm sorry. Standard. I understand you asked some tw ten to twenty questions at the last stand. Uh, <coughs> I, I, I ask questions all the time. Well, uh, agreed. Uh, agreed. agreed. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, if there are no further statements to be made, um, do we agree to accept the recommendations? A. Agree. Agree. B and C <coughs> on pages 205, 206. Agree. Thank you. Let's move on then. Um, the Capital Programmes Outturn Report 2018 to 19, which you'll find on page 216 to 227. I so move that chair. Um, Thank you. Again. And I form a second that chair. Any comments, sir? Well, I, I would say, I come back to the earlier discussion, to a certain extent, with government cutbacks so severely, increasingly with capital programs, it becomes one of capacity. Um, I hope you remember 20 years ago when I was leaving the council, this authority had 1,600 employees, it now has 400. Um, when one actually looks at the very mean ship that we actually run now, it's no surprise sometimes because of the capacity that the, the, the um, capital program is not always quite fulfilled. But nevertheless, but everything's, everything's there and it's actually being done uh, quite well. The highlights, Chair, um, the refer which was referred to earlier on, um, was the continued refurbishment of the Playhouse, uh, the ongoing infrastructure works of the Harlow Enterprise Zone, um, and the, the process of, of our new uh, building um, uh, on that site, which will eventually bring in an income, one hopes, of about half a million pounds a year. Um, the very, very commendable, um, uh, 
I just find it incredible. The play facility next door to the Pets Corner. Corner. Every time I'm walking my dog there, chair, the, the number of very young children with their parents is absolutely outstanding. It, it's almost, even if it's, you know, the weather's bad, the kids are still there. And it's just an amazing uh, new play playground. Um, the general playground refurbishments are across the town. And <laughs> finally, we're getting there with, with Francis Place as well. But that, that's another side of it, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think the scaffolding is coming down in Francis Place. And I'll just draw Councillor's attention to, um, before we move on, you mentioned the playground um, at Pets Corner. I don't know if you're aware, Councillor Dampers, but Harlow's won another award yeah, for um, that hugely successful playground. Yeah, I was just going to just add on, so I certainly concur with Councillor Dampers' remarks, but also add on to his remarks. I think it's worth noting this report. The refurbishment of Bromley Cottages that done within the capital programme is absolutely phenomenal. It was success, and it's not about making money. It's actually about delivering a really important service. But also, we're in the capital programme. The work that's being done on fire safety within the town, which is being covered in this report and the capital programme, another very important issue that this council's tackled, and I believe tackled very, very well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So we're on to questions, um, Councillor Charles. Thank you, Chair. On page 218, my eye was drawn to uh, the budget variances, in particular, and this is one for, for Mark and, and Andrew. Purely out of interest, when you look at internal works and you look at the variance there that's 3, 4, 5, it's purely out of interest. What is driving the upward pressures there? Um, I don't, this isn't a loaded question, it's just an area of interest, obviously, for internal works whether it be bathrooms, toilets or kitchens or whatever. I'd be interested to know if, if in this year in particular there's been certain pressures that have added to the reason why there's been that variance. Uh, I think we are um, in an uh, environment around transition where our focus since 2012 was decent homes and we spent over £100 million to achieve decent homes by 2015, which is a very good news story. The second stage of that is that we're tackling more complex issues now, okay. um, and we're finding that properties that are coming back void require more work than we had anticipated, and that's what we're having to deal with in terms of that part. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Once again, my uh, questions on the housing uh, housing program. <coughs> but, uh, again, it's like uh, uh, Councillor Child. I just have a query on um, page uh, 225, table A2, when we talk about the carryovers on the non housing cover program. Um, about £39,000 for the stove public toilet conversion. Um, just intrigued as to what it's going to be converted to, bearing in mind that the whole area is uh, designated for uh, regeneration. Can I just add that the um, public latitudes is a subject of discussion? Uh, at the moment, an investigation. So I, I can't answer the question, but I certainly uh, the topic is live. Shall we say? Is it? Yes. Oh, well, chair, well, through, the, through the chair, please. Go chair, when the, the toilets were glibly uh, closed all over the town by the last administration, glibly. what was not taken into account was all of the on costs, including things like the business rate, uh, that remain. And at the end of the day, there are, those buildings, unfortunately, still exist. And they, I'm, I'm guessing a bit here, but presumably there are other issues that, that uh, we have to actually make sure that things like... It's a disgrace that they were closed in the first place, and now we've got slightly more cash. As Eugene has said, at least we can actually start to have another look. When you go to almost any other town, there are... In terms of civilisation, there are toys. The Victorians could provide them. Um, I'm quite sure, 100 years on, as a much wealthier country, we can actually get back to actually looking at the provision of public toilets in this town. Yeah, again, thank you, uh, Council Danvers. Um, the question's been asked. We've said we'll get back to you on the detail on it. I think we can move on. You raised it, Sam. Yeah, I just, I just okay. And let's move on. <laughs> thank you.
Any more questions? Right, would anybody like to comment? So, are we happy to accept recommendations A, B, C, and D <coughs> on pages 216 and page 270? Agreed. Thank you. <coughs> so, now we move on to item 14 on the crowded agenda. The revision of the London Road North Enterprise Zone Local Development Order, pages 228-234, Councillor Perth. <coughs> Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, this is a, quite a technical matter, but I hope uh, colleagues will excuse me for explaining it in a little bit more detail. The local development order was, uh, as it says in the report, was drawn up and approved some five years ago. And uh, it sets out policy <coughs> and uh, describes the layout of the enterprise zone, which uh, enabled us to give almost pre-approved, pre-planned application approval for developers, which obviously is very helpful, not only to them in terms of their planning for how they want to proceed, but also um, it's useful in working out the value of the property. But obviously, as everybody knows, land increases in value with uh, planning approval. In those five years, uh, as we all know, the Enterprise Zone has moved on uh, very successfully, and I'm sure Tony will be able to give more uh, information about the economic uh, side of uh, the Enterprise Zone, whereas I'm really dealing with the planning uh, issue of the local development order. But uh, we now need, after five years, obviously we've moved on with the development and things have changed in that time, what we had uh, planned to do is obviously slightly altered, what we want to do in the future is slightly different, and therefore we need to make some revisions to the local development order, not in any principle, um, but simply to change some of the wording of the local development order that reflects the ongoing needs of the enterprise zone, and those are set out in Appendix A, and they mainly relate to the siting of various uh, utilities, the layout of roads, to reflect the, if you like, the, the people that are coming on to the site now, as distinct from the ones that were envisaged five years ago. I mean, it's a sign of the uh, rapid growth of the enterprise zone that we're having to make these changes within five years. But uh, I, as I say, it's a fairly uh, straightforward uh, report asking for the Cabinet to approve the proposed amendment shown in Appendix A uh, and let us get on with the uh, continuing successful development of the Enterprise Zone. Um, I'm sure Tony might have something to say about the success. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to second the report. I'll hold my comments until it's the discussion part. Questions? Comments? Yeah, Chair. First of all, can I thank Andrew Bromwich for uh, providing a tour for Simon and I. I think uh, when people saw Simon and I in hard hats and high vis, there were many secretaries who went on a diet coke break. But uh, there you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, what I would say though is um, obviously we welcome the flexibility that has been proposed um, to the local development order. Obviously there, there has been historic support for this. The Harley Science Park sits within my ward, so I take a special interest in that. I am just grateful for the ongoing dialogue that we have with Andrew, and particularly Councillor Durkin, um, in the constructive approach that we're doing here, um, particularly because this is a, a, another linchpin in the local economy. Thank you. Um, Councillor Durkin. Oh, no, I'm getting lots of it. Sorry, oh, you've already been to the exercise. I was going to take you to the top floor then. Oh, no, it's good for you. It's good for you, isn't it? Is, it? Yeah. it, it and it's actually a great... Oh, no, sorry, when we take over, uh, Chair, we'll take over the, um, the building in September, I will want and invite cabinet members and all councillors to actually come 
into the building and we would have a conversation on the top floor because it really does give you a fantastic view of what the Harlow Science Park is. And this is why this report is so important that as, as my colleague Danny has said, it does give us and provides us with the flexibility uh, that enables us to build what we want when we want it and to build it at the right time for the right reasons. However, we do need to be absolutely clear that if we are doing anything, there will be public consultation. So we don't want the residents of Old Harlow or New Hall to be concerned or worried about this. And also to have those assurances, which is also contained in the report, is that this development zone stays within our current boundaries. It doesn't move anywhere else, so no one else should have any fears or concerns about these areas. Uh, but as, as Danny was saying, over the last two years we have found some technical problems, it's like the electric substation and the challenges that we've been facing there, which therefore has restricted us in being able to look at our food, drink and leisure industry that we actually want to put on that site for the people who are going to be working there. So that's why this report is a technical report, but it's an important report because it does allow us that flexibility to make those choices. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kirk. There's no other comments. Are we happy to accept recommendations A and B on page 228? Agreed. Thank you. So now we move on to agenda item 15, the housing assistance policy, home adaptation for disabled people, pages 235 to 240. Um, I'll move that, Chair. Thank you. Do we have a second? I'll second that. I will be very brief because um, I, I don't think this is a contentious item at all. Um, I welcome this report very much so, and, and the report is quite clear and precise. This is about better joined up thinking between uh, local authorities and welfare panels and obviously more importantly the NHS. Um, we all see in common terminology about bed blocking in hospitals across this country. Many people are um, <coughs> to bed sometimes, sometimes hospital because basically they don't have a home that's so fit for purpose for them to return to. And this is obviously a step in the right direction. We already get funded anyway, but now we have increased funding um, to try and address some of these really important issues for people. Um, and I certainly want to report back to taking questions, Chair. Questions? None? Good. Any, uh, oops, I don't uh, I was just going to add that um, I saw a couple of case studies of people who would be very positively affected by this. Um, people with terminal illnesses who have got very short lifespan and are not able to be in their home in the kind of comfort that you would hope for someone in their last month. So reading those um, short case studies really brought home to me how incredibly important this is. So. Uh, thank you, Chair. Again, uh, I welcome this report. I've had a number of cases in Old Harlow where uh, home adaptions for disabled people has been really important. So I've had cases where I've had blind and visually impaired individuals that have required guiding lighting in their kitchen to prepare meals and to navigate their household. Also, uh, uh, wheelchair users accessing um, monies for home adaptions is really important. It's a fundamental um, issue that on a, a across authority basis sometimes has to be dealt with. So I very much welcome this. Um, obviously within the budget in 2018 the Chancellor announced the additional 45 million for the Disabled Facilities Grant which has enabled actually to see um, an increase in uh, local authorities being able to support <coughs> disabled people uh, in their homes to have the required home adaptions and that's something I think that we can all agree is, is a positive step forward. Councillor yeah. Shears. So um, I was the and uh, I wanted to just say about you know people that are inappropriately placed in hospital um, because they don't have you know the right adaptions or the right property to come home. And what we do know is that people thrive better in their own homes than they do in hospital. So you know this is a really really welcome report. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, Jim. Um, 
As everybody has said, uh, welcome to this report. It's, uh, no, it's not, uh, not non-contentious. Uh, and also to, to recognise a, a, a bit of uh, common sense by the government in, in relaxing regulations uh, to, uh, to, you know, to improve the lives of, of, of people, as, as, as we've already heard. I'm not, I'm not going to uh, uh, repeat all that. Uh, just to uh, thank the officers for the briefing they gave me uh, uh, last week. Um, Just on a very small detail, if I draw your attention to the bottom of page 240 to the footnotes, um, it refers to the uh, ability of people to actually claim DFGs. And it says um, people with disabilities for the purpose of policy means people who are or who are entitled to be registered disabled and people receiving severe disabled allowance or disability living allowance. Uh, as, I'm sure most of you, as I'm sure most of you are aware, um, you can't apply for DLA if you're over the age of 16, it's now a personal independent age. So I'd, I'd be grateful when the policy is actually published, uh, if that can be amended. You know, because obviously I wouldn't want people to sort of go one way through this and then sort of stumble at the last step because they think they're not entitled to it. I will make sure that's uh, updated, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, as, um, uh, as a, a nursing professional, can I, can I just say we need to drop this word bed blockers. They're not bed blockers, they're actually victims who are unfortunately have got themselves into a hospital and because of genuine reasons they cannot go back. Um, and it sounds like bed blocker means that they're doing it deliberately. No one wants to go to hospital. No, no, well that's actually true. That is, that is, we need to make sure the terminology. I think one of the issues that we've got in Harlow, and we have to accept it, is a lot of the houses that were built in the 50s and 60s were badly designed. And that therefore they restrict our opportunities of making these adjustments that need to be. And what, what we need to do as uh, the, the future people is that we've got to make sure that we design houses that are better designed, mm -hmm. that are equipped to be able to be moved around and changed to enable a person to live in it for their whole life rather than for their section of the life. But there, we can do our bit as a council, but there is a fundamental crisis in social care. And unless we have a government that is strong enough to turn around face it and deal with it, we can paint over the cracks as much as we possibly can and we do and we will because we care passionately for our community. We do need a strong government that is willing to commit to actually resolve the challenges that we have today and tonight around the terrible state of social care <coughs> in our country. Right, if there are no more comments, um, do we have recommendations? Um, a and B on page 235. Great. Thank you. So now let's move <coughs> on to uh, item 17, the carbon <coughs> management. Oops, <okay. coughs> yes, Chair, as uh, this report points out, um, in March 2016, Cabinet uh, agreed to adopt a carbon management plan for five, uh, five years, which set the council target to reduce its carbon emissions by 25%. Uh, to, to date, at the end of 2018-19, that's obviously uh, last uh, March, the council had, had achieved a reduction of around about 14%. Obviously not, uh, if you put it in a linear sense, they're obviously not going to achieve the, uh, on, on the basis of what they were doing at the time, they were obviously not going to achieve the 25% uh, by the end of 2021. The officers have therefore uh, brought forward a, a number of further projects uh, which would enable them to meet the target. But um, they're concerned that uh, they might not be able to meet the target by the end of 2021. And uh, you were referring earlier to a stretch issue. Well, this is stretching the, where the finishing line is. It's moving the finishing line possibly 
uh, another year on in order to achieve the 25%. Obviously, it is, uh, it's regrettable that that situation has come about. But, um, you know, it's easy for councillors to set targets. It's not always easy for officers to uh, meet those targets. <coughs> and um, they are trying as hard as they can with the plans that they put forward. It's also interesting in the report to note that 50% um, of the council's total carbon emissions are, 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 are uh, produced by the various parts of the operational fleet of vehicles. And as uh, we remember from the council meeting last week, um, <coughs> we've announced our intention to move towards vehicles that don't make those carbon emissions. And so overall, well, I think that we are going to move uh, rapidly to achieve a new target uh, as part of our uh, carbon emergency, climate emergency uh, program. But anyway, this, uh, this report is asking us to approve the possible extension of the carbon management plan an extra year, unless, of course, as it says, unless the target is reached prior to this date, which uh, the plan will have been achieved. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I'll second that. Are there any questions? Any comments? Right, well then, too quick for me. Um, are we happy to accept the recommendation A on page 247? <coughs> Right, communications from committees, working groups, parties and panels. Um, there is a supplementary um, communication from the, to the Cabinet Overview Working Group. Um, we are, as a result of the Council meeting last Thursday, we are asking the Cabinet Overview Working Group to look at um, issues around the green agenda that this council adopted when it declared a climate emergency, things like the um, costs of uh, photovoltaic cells and the suitability of all of our buildings to um, accommodate those. Um, do we need to agree that? We do. Are we agreed to send that? Absolutely. Agreed. Great. Thank you. Um, agenda item 19, the minutes of panels working groups. Um, we need to note the minutes of the shareholders subcommittee. Noted. 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 Thank you. And there are no matters of urgent business. Thank you all for coming. I draw the meeting to a close. Thank you.